In the next four lectures, we will be going over the brainstem. Well, this lecture is on the medulla, then we'll have a lecture on the pons, midbrain, and then finally the cerebellum. And we'll see that all of these uh, tie together um, very closely. As always, my emphasis is on the clinical aspects. So um, we want to emphasize if you have a lesion in a certain place, understanding what that patient might present with, what sort of exam findings they might have, and so on. So um, these are not mine, but are just, they're commonly out there in review books and so on, so I thought I would include them. They're not entirely accurate, but it's maybe a helpful starting point here. These are called the rule of fours with regards to the brainstem. And so it said there are four cranial nerves in each section, so cranial nerves three and four, are in and around the midbrain. Cranial nerves 5 through 8 relate to the pons, and cranial nerves 9 through 12 are associated with the medulla. Now, I didn't include cranial nerves 1 and 2 um, here because really, as we will see, those are central nervous system pathways. They're myelinated by oligodendrocytes, just like other central nervous system pathways. All of the other cranial nerves, 3 through 12, are myelinated by Schwann cells. They're part of the peripheral nervous system. Um, with regards to cranial nerves 5 through 8 and the pons, um, the trigeminal nerve is uh, some portions of it uh, loop way down into the medulla, are quite extensive in the medulla, so um, that's not uh, entirely accurate, but again, I think it's a helpful starting point. Um, also useful, useful to know that cranial nerves that divide evenly into 12 are found in the midline. So we will see cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6 in our subsequent lectures as midline nuclei. And uh, in this lecture, we'll point out the hypoglossal nucleus, which is midline. We'll also see that cranial nerves that do not divide evenly into 12 are found more laterally. Um, again, there's an exception to that. We'll see the seventh nerve uh, loop around into a very uh, midline portion in the pons. Um, there are four midline pathways and structures. Two of them even have the name medial in it, the medial longitudinal fasciculus and the medial lemniscus, uh, the motor tract of the cortical spinal tract, and the motor nuclei for cranials 3, 4, 6, and 12, again, are midline. Whereas sensory pathways tend to be more uh, laterally placed, the spinothalamic tract, spinocerebellar tracts, the sympathetic chain that, um, remember there's a three-order neuron chain that goes from the hypothalamus down to the spinal cord and back up to the pupil and other places, and that first-order connection uh, goes through the brainstem and, and the lateral portion. We'll see a very important clinical application of that um, here at the end of this lecture. And then we have sensory cranial nerve nuclei, which are more laterally placed. All right, so here's a nice uh, drawing. A uh, recent graduate of uh, Loma Linda uh, created for me recently. So our lecture, uh, again, focuses down here on the medulla. And so I'll just point out a couple of things. We can see there's a green um, nucleus here. It's labeled the substantia gelatinosa. Remember we talked about that in the spinal cord lecture and said that that's a very important uh, nucleus for uh, the recognition and, and reception processing of pain. And notice that that just continues on and now it's called the spinal trigeminal nucleus. So this is really just a continuation of the same nucleus. In the spinal cord it's substantia gelatinosa, that's pain for the arm and leg. But in the uh, for the face, we now call it the spinal trigeminal nucleus. Okay, so it's really the same structure, but uh, once we get above the neck, then we call it the spinal trigeminal nucleus. Um, now, the cranial nerves, remember 9 through 12, we associate with the um, medulla here. So we have in red the hypoglossal nucleus with all of its branches coming out here. Um, we see the spinal accessory uh, nucleus and the accessory nerve 11 here. And then the vagus nerve here is are all of the fibers coming out here in blue. 
and we will see very important nuclei that contribute to these cranial nerves. So obviously the hypoglossal nucleus uh, feeds the uh, hypoglossal nerve, but very important back here, we see the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus and the solitary nucleus. We will describe um, in detail um, the function of those, and another very important nucleus here called the nucleus ambiguous. Okay, and so a lot of our lecture will be describing the function of these nuclei um, here in the uh, medulla. So it's very important as we go through this lecture that, you know, we'll be going through sections and, uh, you know, we'll talk about clinical syndromes that occur in all of these locations, but we always want to keep the three-dimensional uh, aspect in mind. Remember, there are pathways that are traveling up and down, and so as we, you know, go through these sections, um, you always want to take a step back and remind yourself, okay, what's going north-south, what's going south and north, um, and so on. And so one thing that I think will be um, quite helpful for you, uh, again, a medical student who just graduated last year spent a long time on this project, and uh, here at the link, um, you can click on this, and it's a very nice uh, 3D drawing of a brainstem. Here we can see all the cranial nerves, you can click on labels and have everything labeled. You can show the slices and, again, rotate it around in three dimensions. And he labeled all of the slices so that you can kind of see, you know, what is what pathway, what nuclei are at every um, level. And I hope this will help you also to remember, you know, like, for example, here's the cortical spinal tract. Well, we're going to see it in a section here, but don't forget, you know, it is traveling down this way. And we want to remember about where it is throughout its entire length um, here of the brainstem. All right, so let's start um, really at the lowest level here in the medulla, just above the spinal cord. And about the first thing that happens when we go from the cervical spinal cord into the medulla is we have the crossing of the cortical spinal tract. Uh, so remember, here are the medullary pyramids right here. And as these travel down into the lower part of the medulla, the fibers cross over. So we're way down at a lower um, section here. And so as we look at this, I'm going to first go through the labeled um, sections with you. Um, I probably should have a student do a more professional uh, representation of this. These are just my drawings here on notability to indicate all the nuclei and the pathway so that in the lecture you don't have to frantically write everything down. I, I did it all for you. But what I su would suggest you do is to first go through the labeled sections, and then I have an unlabeled section and see how many you can come up with. Again, this is, tends to be a more difficult area of neurology, and so another student did some cartoon drawings. If this helps you to, you know, you can see the crab claws here and all of that. Um, anything that is helpful, you know, for you to pull this together. Also, when you go through the handout, um, Things that have an asterisk, uh, that's important that you're able to identify it um, at that level. Okay, there are a lot of things in here that I specifically don't want you to try to remember because it's just, you know, too hard sometimes. The pathways and the nuclei um, kind of merge together. So I will only ask you things that are um, really distinctive. So let's start with the pathways. Um, here in the lower medulla. Now this does look a lot different than the spinal cord, but if we just think of, you know, what's in the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord back here? Well, we have the posterior columns, right? And so this is really just the rostral continuation of that. So we have the fasciculus grossalis and the fasciculus cuneatus back here. So remember, this is vibration, proprioception for the leg um, below T6, and for the arms above T6. So if we were to have a lesion back here, um, this pathway is not crossed yet, right? So the patient would have an ipsilateral loss of vibration and proprioception below the level of the lesion. Okay, so we have these two pathways. And I'll just point out here are the nuclei. This is where it's synapsing. So this is the nucleus grossalis and the nucleus cuneatus. You can say it either way, the gracile nucleus, um, but um, you know either is fine. So this is where we have the synapse of the pathway for vibration proprioception. Okay, so I mentioned the distinctive feature of this section is that we have the crossing 
of the corticospinal tract or the decussation of the corticospinal tract. And so this is really important because any time we see the corticospinal tract above this level, and I ask you what deficit would the patient have, uh, anything above this, the pathway hasn't crossed yet, right? Because this is going from the motor cortex down to appropriate anterior horn cells in the spinal cord. So any lesion of the corticospinal tract above this will produce contralateral weakness and upper motor neuron findings. Any lesion of the corticospinal tract below this level will produce ipsilateral weakness and upper motor neuron findings. Okay, so that is extremely important. Just like in the spinal cord, we have the dorsal and the ventrospinal cerebellar tract, which are here in this location. Here we have the spinothalamic tract. So remember, unlike the posterior columns, pain and temperature information crosses over very soon after it enters the spinal cord. So anytime, whether we're in the spinal cord or in the brainstem, and you're asked what deficit would occur from a lesion of the spinothalamic tract, the answer will always be loss of pain and temperature on the opposite side. Okay, so um, now what does this nucleus look like here? And all these brainstem sections here in the Diarmid atlas, the, the nuclei are white, and this looks like the substantia gelatinosa, doesn't it? Well, uh, again, this is just the rostral continuation of that same nucleus, but now in the brainstem we call it the spinal trigeminal nucleus. Okay, and right behind it is the spinal trigeminal tract. Remember in the spinal cord we called this Lissauer's tract, but now we call it the spinal trigeminal tract. So a lesion here of either the tract or the nucleus will give a patient uh, ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation, um, but this time on the face, not of the arm and leg. Okay, so we pointed out the spinal trigeminal nucleus. I already pointed out the um, nucleus gracilis and cuneatus um, out here. Um, this looks like the ventral horn of the spinal cord, doesn't it? Well, it's just the rostral continuation of that. And so really all that's left here is we see the spinal accessory nucleus for 11. Remember, cranial nerve 11 supplies the sternocleidomastoid and the upper uh, trapezius muscle. All right, so those are the main... Uh, nuclei and pathways to know at this level. And again, I would suggest that you um, see how much you can identify now on an unlabeled section, All right? So always remember, okay, what's posterior? So this has to be fasciculus grossalis, cuneatus, nucleus grossalis, cuneatus, spinal trigeminal nucleus, and tract, the dorsal and uh, ventral spinal cerebellar tracts, the um, spinal accessory nucleus, and here the decussation um, of the cortical spinal tract. Those would be some of the um, highlights. Now, when we go a little bit higher, now he didn't label everything, so this one's kind of you know in between uh, these sections here. Uh, after the motor decussation, a little bit higher, we reach the level of the sensory decussation. And so we can see that what's crossing over here um, are the vibration proprioception fibers. So that's kind of the next uh, major thing that happens here as we go up um, through the brainstem. So the nuclei of the grossalis and cuneatus are larger, which kind of makes sense because the further up you get, the more of the pathways of synapse here. So we have the nucleus grossalis cuneatus, and so, and the fasciculus here is a little bit behind it. We don't see much of the fasciculus there, but still quite a bit of the fasciculus cuneatus. So remember, a lesion here would produce ipsilateral loss of vibration proprioception below the level of the lesion. All right, but what is happening here is that after the fasciculus uh, grossalis and cuneatus synapse, this is when we have the crossing of these vibration proprioception fibers. So they cross over like this, and they form a pathway here, which will get larger and larger as we go up through the brainstem, and this is called the medial lemniscus. Okay, so when you hear medial lemniscus, you want to think uh, just the rostral continuation of the posterior columns, except now it has crossed. Okay, so if you were asked 
what would happen with the lesion of the medial lemniscus? The answer is now you would have contralateral loss of vibration and proprioception. Okay, so that's the important crossing here. And the name of these fibers that cross over, and we can kind of, you can see the circular pattern. These would be coming over to the opposite side over here. Um, but these crossing fibers are called the internal arcuate fibers. And so we always want to kind of compare and contrast vibration and proprioception pathways with pain and temperature pathways. Remember that pain and temperature crosses in the spinal cord as the ventral white commissure, whereas vibration and proprioception crosses in the medulla as the internal arcuate fibers. Okay, now... Um, we will see this familiar theme all the way up through the medulla. We have three pathways kind of standing on top of each other. I've already pointed out the medial lemniscus. Now here is the cortical spinal tract, which remember in the medulla we call it the medullary pyramid. Okay, so remember this pathway is started in the motor cortex. It's working its way down. Um, and it, we saw it cross below this level. So a lesion here would produce contralateral upper motor neuron weakness. So we have the cortical spinal tract, the medial lemniscus, and standing on top of that is the tectospinal tract. Um, remember in the spinal cord lecture, I mentioned the tectospinal tract that connects the superior and inferior colliculus with the cervical anterior horn cells. This is the pathway that allows you to turn your neck in response to a visual or an auditory um, stimulus. Okay, so these three pathways then um, are midline. Okay, the nuclei I've already pointed out here, nucleus gracilis, cuneatus, and then still the spinal trigeminal nucleus here and over here. Um, I didn't point out this spinal trigeminal tract, but it's still gonna be right adjacent to the spinal trigeminal nucleus. Now you'll notice in your handout that I did not put an asterisk by the dorsal and ventral spinocerebellar tract, which are here, and the spinothalamic tract, which is here. And the reason I didn't, I mean, I, I want you to know that they're there, but I would, would not ask you to identify them, is look over here on the unlabeled section. I mean, this is, how could you really confidently say exactly where one pathway ends and the other begins? So that's why, you know, to, to know they're still there, but um, certainly not something where I would point an arrow at either any of those pathways and ask you to identify it. Okay, now other nuclei, and again, these will become more obvious as we go up, but we will see these three nuclei become larger as we go up through the medulla. First, we have the hypoglossal nucleus. Okay, remember the 12th cranial nerve is midline, so you can't get more midline than that. Okay, then we go out to the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve, which is much larger on the next section up. And then further out here, we have the nucleus solitarius, which has a tract adjacent to, the, to it. So there's the nucleus solitarius and the nucleus solitarius tract. Over here, remember black are pathways. So here's the pathway, the nucleus surrounds it. Okay, so these are important um, um, nuclei here that you understand the function. Another nucleus, uh, again, I would never ask you to identify this because it's just such a vague, you really can't, doesn't stand out, but is the nucleus ambiguous. Okay, again, not a typo, U-U-S, nucleus ambiguous. This has a very important function, but uh, literally to identify it, it's ambiguous. So what I really want you to know, very important, is that the nucleus ambiguous is in the lateral medulla. So let's talk about the function of um, some of these areas. Um, and again, hypoglossal nucleus, dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, and then the solitary nucleus and tract. So there's some important clinical significance here. Let's start with this solitary nucleus. So I highlighted the S here because you need to remember this as a sensory nucleus and tract. And it's sensory for 7, and I'm going to emphasize its function here for 9 and 10 in a little bit. So it's sensory. All of the information, sensory information, viscera from the head, throat, thoracic, and abdominal cavities, 
enter into the um, via cranial nerves 9 and 10 headed for the solitary nucleus. So these are stretch receptors in the lung, and for our purpose, we'll say a little bit about these pressure receptors, which are in the arterial system, okay, along the carotid body, the aorta. These sensory receptors feed into cranial nerves 9 and 10, and ultimately the solitary nucleus and tract. Uh, in terms of taste, um, Remember, the anterior two-thirds of the tongue is uh, taste for seven, the posterior one-third, uh, nine and ten, and so taste is destined for the solitary nucleus and tract via those um, cranial nerves. So therefore, if we have a lesion of the solitary nucleus um, and tract, we're going to have a loss of taste, and because of the distortion of the information coming from these pressure receptors, that leads to an increase in heart rate, that's called tachycardia, and it tends to lead to blood pressure instability, which means a patient with a stroke, let's say in that area um, of the medulla, their blood pressure may widely fluctuate up and down. All right, so here is the solitary tract, and there is the nucleus, okay? And um, it is immediately adjacent, as we said, to the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. And these two nuclei work together. All right, so let's say we have a situation where the blood pressure is uh, significantly elevated and the heart rate is significantly elevated for whatever reason, okay? That's going to be detected here in these stretch receptors in the aorta, um, in the carotid body and sinus, and that feeds in here via cranial nerves 9 and 10 into the solitary nucleus and tract, so it is aware of the elevated um, heart rate and blood pressure, Okay, that then activates the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, which we're going to come to in just a minute here. But the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus is parasympathetic. It's the parasympathetic contribution, um, especially to cranial nerve 10. And so, remember, sympathetics are fight or flight. Parasympathetics is rest and digest. So when you stimulate the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, since it's parasympathetic, it then has an effect to slow the heart rate down and to lower the blood pressure. Okay, also uh, shown here, we have the, remember um, the preganglionic sympathetics here are in, mainly in the thoracic spinal cord, about in this location. And so I just kind of wanted to contrast here that the sympathetics can activate the heart to increase the heart rate and the blood pressure, whereas the parasympathetics via the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve are acting to do the opposite. So we have this fine uh, balance between the two. Now, clinically, this is important because um, we have this reflex known as Cushing's reflex. And if you see this, it's very alarming and uh, indicates uh, a neurologic emergency. This occurs when we have increased intracranial pressure. That may be from a large bleed in the brain, or maybe the patient has a brain tumor that's begun to herniate. And in that process, what happens is the increase in cranial pressure activates the hypothalamus and the sympathetics that um, are activated by the hypothalamus. So that leads the blood pressure to be increased. That's a good thing, actually, because if there's increased pressure in the brain, it, it needs more blood flow to get oxygen to the areas of the brain that are you know, getting less perfusion. So uh, the blood pressure goes up. Okay, and that is detected then, remember, by the baroreceptors here in the carotid sinus, in the aorta as well. And so remember, that goes in to the solitary nucleus and tract and activates the parasympathetics. The parasympathetics then bring the heart rate down, and that is known as bradycardia. Now, this is rather complex here. Um, the heart rate goes down as part of Cushing's reflex, but because of the increased intracranial pressure and the need for oxygenation, probably of the brain, the systolic blood pressure stays elevated. The diastolic tends to be low. And so, um, and we can also have these irregular respirations. Later on, I will tell you about chain Stokes respirations. So this is a triad here for Cushing's reflex. So what does a patient look like then that has increased intracranial pressure? Well, they've got a bleed in the brain or a tumor or something, so they're, they're complaining of a headache usually. 
increased intracranial pressure also tends to cause a lot of nausea and vomiting and encephalopathy, which remember means confusion. All right. So if you have a confused patient in the emergency room who's complaining of a headache and maybe nausea, and you also notice that their systolic blood pressure is really high and their heart rate is low, uh, that patient needs an emergent brain scan. Okay, Cushing's reflex means there's increased intracranial pressure. This is a neurologic emergency. We need to find out uh, you know, what it is that's, that's causing this. So remember, the solitary nucleus and tract is also important for taste. So here we can see taste, anterior two-thirds of the tongue via seven, posterior one-third, uh, and palate nine and ten. So this goes into the solitary nucleus and tract. And remember, everything except for olfaction has to go through the thalamus. And uh, in a subsequent lecture, we'll go through all the different thalamic nuclei. But for taste, it gets to the thalamus via this solitariothalamic tract, which tells you exactly what it does. It's going from the solitary nucleus to the thalamus. All right, so it goes up to the um, thalamic nucleus and to the brain, and we'll talk about those areas uh, in more detail later. So solitary nucleus is sensory. The nucleus ambiguous is motor. Okay, and so this nucleus supplies the pharyngeal muscles, and the laryngeal muscles. So therefore, it's important for swallowing and phonation. And extremely important, as I mentioned, that you remember the nucleus ambiguous is in the lateral medulla. And so if we have a lesion of the nucleus ambiguous and you affect the supply to pharyngeal muscles, patients have dysphagia, okay, which, remember, is difficulty swallowing. They choke when they try to drink a glass of water, for example. Okay, and a lesion of the nucleus ambiguous that affects laryngeal muscles will cause slurred speech or dysarthria. Um, frequently, uh, dysphonia, which is kind of a soft, hoarse voice, and hiccups are a classic feature of a lesion of the lateral medulla. Okay, and I'm going to go over lateral medullary syndrome in detail here at the end of the lecture. All right, so here we have the nucleus ambiguous. And we are kind of emphasizing here its function in terms of output via cranial nerves 9 and 10 to um, the phonation and uh, the, the larynx. All right, so um, from here on up, again, another student did some nice cartoon drawings to try to help you with this. And so, again, just kind of helpful to see where we're at. Our next section here will be up. Um, kind of at this level here of the medulla. There's the cartoon drawing. And then in our lecture next time, we'll go over these three sections of the pons, and then we'll uh, go over these sections of the midbrain. All right, so um, our next section here is right about there. And so this is the rostral sensory decussation. It's a little higher up, and it's still the same decussation Okay, it's the internal arcuate fibers coming from the nucleus grossus and cuneatus. Okay, here we can see them kind of curving over. But now notice that the medial lemniscus is much larger here, and that's just because more and more of these, they keep crossing over. Okay, so again, medial lemniscus, a rostral continuation of the posterior columns, and most important to remember is that um, here are these fibers have crossed. So we don't have much left. We can still see a little bit of the fasciculus grossalis, cuneatus, the nucleus grossalis, and cuneatus, respectively, um, the spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract. And again, these three pathways here kind of mush together, so I won't ask you to identify them, but we're still seeing the dorsal and ventrospinocerebellar tract. And it is very important that you just know that the spinal thalamic tract is in the lateral medulla just like the nucleus ambiguous is in the lateral medulla, okay? Um, but you obviously couldn't identify which white speck it is, but it's in this region here um, of the lateral medulla. Okay, so I've pointed out the internal arcuate fibers. Um, these three pathways still kind of standing on top of each other here from the medullary pyramid or the corticospinal tract, the medial lemniscus, and the tectospinal tract. 
Okay, and remember the nuclei back here, now larger, so we have the hypoglossal nucleus, again midline. Moving out laterally, we have the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, and the solitary tract, which is black, with the white nucleus around it. Okay, so again, hypoglossal nucleus, dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, solitary nucleus and tract, and we've described the function of um, each of those. Um, one other thing now that shows up as something new here is that we can see just lateral to the medullary pyramid the inferior olivary nucleus. And we saw this in our brain dissection um, lab. Remember, it's just lateral to the medullary pyramids. The inferior olivary nucleus um, is probably, um, think of it as just a displaced portion of the um, cerebellum. It seems to be important for um, cerebellar circuits. And we, when we do all of the cerebellar pathways, um, I'll, I'll spend some time on that. Okay, now just to say a little bit more about the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. So I've already said this is the parasympathetic uh, contribution. So these are preganglionic fibers that supply the heart, lung, GI tract up to the splenic flexure. And because it's parasympathetic, it's rest and digest. So it's going to slow the heart and it's going to stimulate the um, GI tract. Okay, again, in contrast to sympathetics, which do exactly the opposite. So therefore, if we have a lesion of the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus or of the vagus nerve itself, since it normally wants to um, slow the heart, if you have a lesion there, you'll get an increased heart rate. That's known as tachycardia. And more often, what we see is the effects of medications um, called uh, anti-muscarinic medications. These are medications that block acetylcholine, and acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that is used by the vagus nerve on the heart and on the GI tract. So these medications that block acetylcholine, and later on we'll go through the list of these, um, they're very commonly prescribed. And so if you know you're using an anti-muscarinic medication, then you're going to want to tell that, warn that patient about the possibility of constipation. Um, since acetylcholine is also important for contraction of the bladder, we may have urinary retention. And again, since the parasympathetics normally want to slow the heart, if you give an anti-muscarinic medication, then the heart rate may go up. Again, again uh, tachycardia. Okay. So again, here's our dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, um, hypoglossal nucleus, dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, and kind of out here is the solitary nucleus and tract. So supplying the lung, slowing the heart rate down, important for digestion here via its effect on the liver and the um, GI tract. Okay, now we'll get to the two most important clinical syndromes of the medulla. Okay, this is really where it pays off learning all of this because you can see patients that um, have lesions here and figure things out, but only if you know the anatomy. So first we have the medial medullary syndrome. Okay, and so the three things that are affected in medial medullary syndrome are the cortical spinal tract or the medullary pyramids, the medial lemniscus, and the hypoglossal nucleus, all right? And so um, the anterior spinal artery branches off of the anterior spinal artery, dive deep down to supply the medial medulla. So if we have an occlusion there, then the patient will present with this syndrome. So uh, this is usually a stroke, so it comes on abruptly. And so if you have a lesion of the cortical spinal tract, remember the weakness is going to be on the opposite side. So we'll have contralateral weakness of the opposite arm and leg. Remember the cortical spinal tract is an upper motor neuron pathway, so we're going to have upper motor neuron findings in the opposite arm and leg as well. Brisk reflexes, clonus, Babinski, um, spasticity, and so on. Medial lemniscus, remember that the fibers that become the medial lemniscus um, have crossed over at this point. So we're going to have a contralateral loss of vibration proprioception in the opposite arm and leg. And then the hypoglossal nucleus, um, cranial nerves do not cross, with the exception of the fourth cranial nerve. And that really is not important clinically. 
And so um, a lesion of the hypoglossal nucleus is going to affect the ipsilateral half of the tongue, and that results in the tongue deviating to the side of the lesion. Or you could say it deviates away from the hemiplegia. Okay, so medial medullary syndrome involves the cortical spinal tract, produces contralateral spastic weakness, the medial lemniscus, which produces contralateral loss of vibration proprioception, and the hypoglossal nucleus here, which results in tongue deviation. Now you might ask, what about the tectospinal tract? And probably because there's some uh, crossing of this pathway, um, that patients don't tend to get difficulty turning their head in response to a sound or visual um, stimuli. All right, so here we're looking at the midbrain pons medulla. This is the left, this is the right. And so here is our lesion here in the medial medulla. So this shows you the three things that are affected. First of all, the descending cortical spinal tract. So our lesion is there. We're going to have spastic weakness on the opposite side. Here we have the posterior columns, the internal arcuate fibers, and now this is the medial lemniscus right here. And so a lesion there will give the patient contralateral loss of vibration proprioception. And here is the hypoglossal nucleus, which will result in ipsilateral weakness of that half of the tongue. So if a lesion is on the left side, then the patient will have those motor and sensory deficits in the right arm and leg, and then the tongue is going to deviate to the left. I find it most easiest, most helpful to remember that the tongue points away from the hemiplegia. You could say the tongue points toward the lesion, but more practically, when you're seeing someone in the emergency room, you don't know where the lesion is yet. And so um, seeing the tongue point away from the hemiplegia tells you that the lesion um, has to be uh, in the medial medulla. All right, and... Uh, We'll get to radiology later. Here are the vertebral arteries here. Flowing blood looks black on an MRI scan. And so this is a stroke involving the uh, medial medulla. And sometimes you can have occlusion of both um, anterior spinal arteries. This is, produces the so-called heart sign here. These are, each half of this is the uh, medullary pyramid that's affected. And here's the medial lemniscus. We really can't follow it all the way back to the hypoglossal nuclei very, very well. But you can imagine that these patients are quite devastated because now you knock out both cortical spinal tracts, so they're weak on both sides. They have loss of vibration proprioception on both sides. Um, I've only seen one patient with this, so it's certainly not uh, very common. <clears throat> Excuse me. So remember that um, here are the vertebral arteries, and there we can see the anterior spinal artery right here. So, um, you know, we can have medial medullary syndrome from occlusion of the vertebral, but more likely it's an occlusion here of the small penetrating branches off of the anterior spinal artery. And you can see those lie right on the medullary pyramids, okay? So it's part of the medial medullary syndrome. Now, lateral medullary syndrome comes from an occlusion either of the pica, right here, which supplies the lateral medulla, or actually somewhat more often it's an occlusion of the vertebral artery, and then the patient gets the stroke in the distribution of the pica. All right, so that'll be our next uh, syndrome here after we go through this next section um, of the medulla. So this is at the level of cranial nerves 10 and 12. So here we can see the vagus nerve coming out right here and the hypoglossal nerve coming out right here. And when we went through a, a brain dissection lab, I mentioned that the um, hypoglossal nerve comes out between the medullary pyramid, which we can see here, and the inferior olivary nucleus, which we can see here. So there can be only one nerve that, you know, this could be, it's uh, 12. Okay, so in terms of pathways, we still have the cortical spinal tract, or the medullary pyramid, the medial lemniscus, and the tectospinal tract here along the midline. Another very large pathway that shows up here, right here and over here. These are the so-called um, dog ears of the medulla, um, or in the, this medical student's mind, uh, the 
wings of the butterfly out here is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Now this will make more sense when we have our lecture on the cerebellum, but three out of the four spinocerebellar pathways that communicate with the cerebellum go through the inferior cerebellar peduncle right here. Okay, so most of this is made up of a connection between the spinal cord and the cerebellum. So they're going into the cerebellum like this. Now from the hypoglossal nucleus here, you can actually follow the hypoglossal nerve all the way out. I mean, you see those black strands right there? So this is the hypoglossal nerve, and then we can follow it out um, like that. Now, um, out here, there's a unique appearance. There are actually four um, vestibular nuclei, um, which I'm not asking you to identify, but I would like you to know because it, it's clinically very important. Can you see that this has kind of a salt and pepper appearance here? And the dark little dots here are all part of one pathway known as the lateral vestibular tract. It's actually in the inferior vestibular nucleus. All of these are medial and inferior vestibular nuclei, but you don't need to know that. But I would like you to know that the pathway here is the lateral, uh, the lateral vestibulospinal tract. Um, this is an important upper motor neuron pathway we said in the spinal cord lecture for extension. Okay, and later on when we talk about coma and we talk about decerebrate posturing, where the arms and legs stiffen in a patient who's unresponsive, um, that's a very bad sign, but I want you to know that the pathway involved in that is the lateral vestibulospinal tract. Okay, so it tends to be lesions above this, um, like maybe up in the pons or midbrain, that then disinhibit um, this pathway to cause the arms and legs to go into extension. Now back here we see the fourth ventricle. Remember the fourth ventricle is between the pons and the medulla and the cerebellum, and we can see some choroid plexus back here. Choroid plexus we see in the lateral ventricles, third ventricle, and here in also in the fourth ventricle. Remember it produces CSF. Okay, our, still our familiar nuclei. We pointed out at every section here we have the um, hypoglossal nucleus, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, and here is the solitary tract in the center with the uh, uh, nucleus, solitary nucleus around it. Okay, I think I already point, pointed out the inferior olivary nucleus. And so, um, I've stopped pointing out the spinothalamic tract because it's in kind of a vague location here, but you just want, you just need to know that the spinothalamic tract is in the lateral medulla all the way up. Okay, so when we talk about lateral medullary syndrome, you want to remember that the spinothalamic tract is going to be involved there. Here is still the spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract. So remember this is for pain and temperature for the ipsilateral face. All right, so lateral medullary syndrome. Um, I have a list of top 10 questions that show up on board exams from this entire course, and this would be in the top five, all right? So some uh, board exams uh, will ask about lateral medullary syndrome more than once. And so you really need to spend some time on this, make sure you're very comfortable with lateral medullary syndrome. And so I already mentioned that the blood vessel involved is either occlusion of the pica or the vertebral artery. And then the patient has a stroke in the distribution of the pica. And so, first of all, we have the vestibular nuclei, which are involved. Let's just go back here. So the vestibular nuclei are in the lateral medulla. And so a lesion of the vestibular nuclei will cause a patient to have vertigo. And it makes the eyes jiggle back and forth. That's called nystagmus. And patients have these findings because the vestibular nuclei allow the inner ears right and left to precisely send information to the brain stem and brain about the position of the head. And so if you have a lesion of the vestibular nuclei, 
then you have one inner ear telling the brain something very different than the, what the other inner ear is telling the brain. So that results in a room spinning sensation, and when you look at the eyes, you see nystagmus. Now the descending sympathetics, we said here in the very first slide of this lecture that this travels through the lateral portion of the brain stem. It's very small, so I haven't asked you to identify it, but it, it's the lateral medulla, it's in the lateral medulla, and so if we have a, a lateral medullary stroke, then the patient will have an ipsilateral Horner syndrome. Remember what that looks like. The pupil's a little smaller, that's called meiosis. It's a little droopy, that's called ptosis. And you can have some loss of sweat on the ipsilateral, usually forehead area, that's called anhydrosis. The nucleus ambiguous, we've emphasized, is in the lateral medulla. And so, a major feature of lateral medullary syndrome is dysphagia. These patients are at very high risk of um, getting an aspiration pneumonia. What that means is they try to eat or drink something, and because the swallowing mechanism is you know, disrupted from the lesion of the nucleus ambiguous, uh, fluid, food goes down to the lungs, and then they get a pneumonia. So patients with lateral medullary syndrome, we, we, they should not be eating or drinking. That's very important. Dysphonia and hiccups, remember I mentioned a lesion of the nucleus ambiguous will give you that, a soft, hoarse voice, hiccups. And if you look at the gag reflex, since um, the nucleus ambiguous supplies motor for 9 and 10, then these patients won't have a gag reflex on that side. It's kind of an objective finding. Um, I have had more than one medical student, several through the years actually, that have told me they were on inpatient service for internal medicine or something like that, and someone had hiccups, and they remembered that that could be part of lateral medullary syndrome, and then it was confirmed by doing an MRI scan of the brain. So just remember that. Of course, we all get hiccups occasionally, but if it's part of all of these other things, then you know that it's lateral medullary syndrome. All right, the inferior cerebellar peduncle is part of the lateral medulla. So here is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So that's going to be involved. Remember, this connects with the cerebellum. And so that will cause the patient to have ipsilateral ataxia. So if you're checking finger to nose, they're going to be very clumsy, discoordinated on that side. The spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract are in the lateral medulla. That will give the patient ipsilateral loss of um, sensation on the face. So here is the spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract. Okay, and the spinal thalamic tract is in the lateral medulla, which gives the patient contralateral arm and leg numbness. And when you do your examination, it's going to be pain and temperature. And so this is um, a theme we will see with all of the brainstem syndromes, which is patients will have ipsilateral cranial nerve deficits and contralateral motor or sensory deficits. We saw this with medial medullary syndrome. Remember, they had an ipsilateral hypoglossal neuropathy, contralateral motor and sensory deficits. Here with lateral medullary syndrome, we get all these ipsilateral cranial nerve deficits involving vestibular nuclei, nucleus ambiguous, spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract, but we get a contralateral sensory deficit, pain and temperature. Okay, and so in our case study uh, section, I will show you a video of a patient with lateral medullary syndrome, and he will say that one side of his face is numb, the opposite arm and leg is numb. And just that description alone is strongly suggestive of lateral medullary syndrome. Okay, so again, the spinal thalamic tract out here will give you a contralateral loss of pain and temperature whereas the spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract will give ipsilateral loss of facial sensation. Okay, so here are all the features of lateral medullary syndrome here in a cartoon drawing. So the patient has a pica occlusion or a vertebral occlusion with a resulting stroke. So we get the nucleus ambiguous, dysarthria, dysphagia, hiccups. Um, we have the spinal trigeminal uh, tract, that's the ipsilateral uh, facial sensations lost, vestibular nuclei, gives the patient vertigo, nystagmus. Here's the descending sympathetics, which gives the patient an ipsilateral Horner syndrome. But here is our crossed finding. 
the spinothalamic tract. So a lesion here will give the patient contralateral loss of pain and temperature. So again, just to emphasize, the ipsilateral face is involved pain and temperature. The contralateral arm and leg is involved pain and temperature. Okay, and then the only thing I didn't mention here is that the inferior cerebellar peduncle and the undersurface of the cerebellum is supplied by the pica, and that will give the patient ipsilateral ataxia. Okay, and here's an MRI scan of a patient with lateral medullary syndrome. You can see the medulla is small, a small little lesion there in the lateral medulla, and you can see that the uh, cerebellum um, here is involved as well. All right, and then I would just spend a little time with this uh, cartoon drawing done by the medical student that emphasizes all of the pathways discussed in this lecture.